Hey, happy Monday afternoon with you. Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. Um, excited to join you for another episode of Office Hours Live. So I had a couple of quick news updates to share, and these related to common questions that I see. So I'll take just a minute and talk about those, and then, you know, your top questions. So this is Office Hours Live. If you've not joined me before, I'd love to get some of your detailed questions and talk about them pretty thoroughly. You know, it's pretty easy to find general information all over the web, but it's tricky to find things that are specific and really pertain to them as you are wondering about. So that's what's different about Office Hours Live. And I'm with you guys on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, you know, several platforms, and any of those are totally fine. Let me just get one more tech thing set up here real quick. There we go. Okay, now I can see what's going on all over the place. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, good to see you. And if you put a question up, I have also the option on Facebook and YouTube of just clicking on your question, it'll show up in the display. If you prefer not to see your question show up, just mention that and it won't. <laughs> so easy thing. All right, so a couple quick things in advance just to mention. Uh, a few co questions have come a lot related to news stories one of which was about vitamin D and vitamin D overdose. I've got a brand new podcast up right now, and this is one with a parathyroid surgeon. And she and I talked about some cases that she's had of people that have overdosed in vitamin D, you know, probably not the most precise term. So with vitamin D, there's a toxic range and there's an excessive range. And toxic means it's harmful because the chemical vitamin D is in excess and it's harmful to the body directly. Now, excess is not the same. Excess means that it's doing what it would do and it's not hurting you because of what it is, but it's doing too much of what it would do. So in this case, vitamin D can draw calcium into the bloodstream. And extra calcium in the bloodstream is a pretty big deal. You know, at the extremes, it can be fatal, but at the most subtle variations, it can make someone pretty much disabled. Um, severe fatigue, uh, horrible muscle cramps, severe mood changes, uh, just debilitating exhaustion. And the doctor shared some stories in which she's seen patients present with hypercalcemia. And they were taking vitamin D, but their blood levels weren't alarmingly high. And I've written a lot about vitamin D and talked about how it's a good thing. We need it. A lot of people get too little of it. You know, optimal amounts lower our risk for total mortality. They cut our risk of infectious disease and they cut our risk of autoimmune disease. So a good thing. But that's optimal amounts. And what's not intuitive is that being a smidge above optimal can take away those benefits but cause some of those things to occur negatively. And so, yeah, please enjoy the new episode. She talked about how blood levels as high as, or I should say as low as 60 to 70 nanograms per mil can cause these complications, these hypercalcemic issues. There are those who advocate towards much higher levels of vitamin D, but the cool thing is you can really see all the big benefits of it without having to get in the danger zone. So yeah, check out that episode. Now, another news update, and this overlapped with a question I hear a lot, uh, is about natural versus artificial immunity to COVID. The question I hear is, if I've had it, should I still worry about getting vaccinated or not? And the new study showed that it was a comparison of the rate of infection of those who had had prior COVID against those who were vaccinated. And the generalization was that the natural infection, having the infection, can do a decent job giving you immunity. It seemed to be more specific to the particular variant that you had. So it doesn't give as much immunity to other variants. That's the drawback. And mRNA vaccines are a little better at current variants at a broader range of them. Now, this study didn't extend to the viral vector vaccine, which is Johnson & Johnson. So I don't know if these findings apply to it. But as far as the mRNA vaccines go, it appears that they're five times more likely to grant immunity than natural immunity was. Um, I'm just seeing a comment come up. Natural immunity is 27 times more powerful than the jab. Kate, thank you for that. If you could short share a uh, source for that, share a reference, I'd be happy to give further comment on that. There was a pretty big new study that just came out. Uh, the CDC shared this and they tracked, let me get the numbers. Yeah, they tracked uh, 
6,000 individuals that did develop the infection. And it compared the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated, and it looked at the larger populations from which they were drawn. And the exact number was 5.49, uh, so 5.49 fold. So there is a such thing as natural immunity. It is real. But if one has had that, and they're concerned about infecting others, or they're wondering if vaccination could still help, it still can, especially for the mRNA vaccines. Okay, one more quick update. I'm seeing more comments roll in. So this is one about uh, fatty liver, it looks like. Uh, have to certainly talk about that one. So one more quick update. Uh, this was about, I've got an image to go with this one too. This was about animal fat versus vegetable fat. You know, this has been a big evolution. Way back in the 80s, fat was bad. <laughs> then in the 90s, we started wondering maybe some fat is okay. Uh, for a while in the 2000s, fat was like the darling. And now we're looking critically at fat as a category. There's different types of it. They do different things. So this is a big study that was tracking about 117,000 people from the Nurses Health Study. And they looked at basically dietary fat and cardiovascular disease. And what they saw was that the total amount of fat was not as big of a predictor of heart disease in this one, but the type of fat was a very big predictor. So type of fat they looked at included animal fat and vegetable fat. Now, there's a few things that are kind of different. So within animal fat, what's different is we've got dairy fat. And there's even some subcategories within that. <laughs> as a generalization, animal fat is what you would get from dark poultry, fatty meat, sausages, things like that. Now, dairy fat didn't seem to affect the risk, with the exception of butter. Now, several studies have shown this, that butter doesn't seem to be the same as dairy fat, as far as being more risk-free for cardiovascular disease. So non-butter dairy fat, you know, like, like whole fat yogurt or 2% fat milk or cheese, they don't seem to affect cardiovascular risk. So what's different about butter? Well, calcium and protein, it's quite a bit lower in both. Probably the biggest difference is a thing called milk fat globule membrane. And it's basically a phospholipid that absorbs and makes the fat in milk more soluble. That's present in all versions of dairy foods with the exception of butter. There's not much of that in butter. So yeah, animal fats raised the risk the most. Vegetable fats really did not. And the one exception there was tropical. So tropical fats, um, not solid at room, they're solid at room temperature. So coconut and palm being a little different. And also they have bigger effects upon LDL levels. So they're not bad things and they can have some useful effects, but one would want to keep those to a lower threshold in the diet. So those were a couple of the big updates. I had another one that I may or may not mention but I'm seeing several good questions roll in. So I'm gonna go back to where I can see those and stay on top of them. So just changing screens here for you guys real quick. Okay, and there we go. <laughs> uh, Lynn, Lori, looking good, sounding well, <laughs> looking like yourself again. Thank you guys. Yeah, if you didn't hear, I was out with the West Nile virus for, boy, pretty much non-functional for a month. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was back in first time and really enjoyed that. So probably 95, 98% feeling pretty well. Uh, thankful that it wasn't much worse, but yeah, appreciate the comments. Um, uh, so let me take a look. I'm looking at all the platforms. There was one that I saw that I wanted to jump in at. Here we go. Um, one of my local doctors just passed from NALD. I'm guessing that was uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I was shocked, so sad, no idea he was sick. I remember you saying 80 to 90% of the population has this. How do you know that you have fatty liver disease? Yeah, that that is sad. Um, it's really now already one of the leading causes of death and really is on the uptick in these coming years. Uh, yes, okay, so I was correct for fatty liver, yeah. So NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the acronym basically implies that someone's liver looks like they were an alcoholic, but they weren't. And fatty liver disease is just the fat builds up in the liver. Now, your body creates fuel from any macro molecule. So protein, fats, carbs, ketones, alcohol, they can all make fuel. And they do that in a compound called oxaloacetate. And oxaloacetate has to be burned or it has to be stored. Now, there's a couple versions of that before you get to the very bottom of oxaloacetate, and that's uh, glucose and glycogen and triglycerides. 
So anything can make triglycerides, but only glucose can make glycogen. So yeah, carbs in the form of glucose can make glycogen, but everything else, including carbs, can make triglyceride. So when there's too much triglyceride, your liver is fatty. And in terms of numbers, it's kind of odd. We think about a person would be incredibly lean if they were 5% body fat, but that's too much for your liver. You know, every step above 5% is dangerous. It just gets too gummed up and stuff can't filter through it properly. So 80, 90%, you know, I might have said that off the cuff in adult population. Yeah, okay, I could see that being a fair number. So the tough thing about to say how common it is, is that there's no great screening tests for it. And so you don't really check people out in more thorough ways. Otherwise, you don't help. You don't check healthy people in the most accurate ways. The, the most accurate way to rule out fatty liver is with a liver biopsy. And there aren't a lot of examples to where healthy people are given liver biopsies. So we can't, it's hard to say how prevalent it is, but there were a few studies in which potential liver donors, uh, they're healthy people. And once they had gone through all the other tests, once they were shown to not have liver disease, not be diabetic, have clear ultrasounds, then they were given liver biopsies. So people that had no liver problems, really. And of that group, 42% had fatty liver disease. Now, the general adult population is not as healthy as that group. That general adult population, if we look at the rates of obesity plus overweight, plus a thing called TOFI, uh, thin outside, fat inside, not a great term. You know, I've also heard the term used over fat for it. But basically, those who are at a good scale weight but have too much body fat. So not too heavy, but not, but, but not enough lean tissue, not enough muscle mass. So if you put those three together, they make up about 88% of the population. And the bulk of those have or are at risk for fatty liver. So how do you know if you have it? Well, you're at risk when your height to waist ratio is getting close to one half, meaning that the distance around your belly button is half as much as your height. Uh, if a woman's five feet tall, she would be 60 inches. So if the circumference around her belly button was getting close to 30 inches, she would be at pretty big risk for that. One other way we see the risk start to emerge is by liver enzymes. A lot of you guys are savvy and you look at your own blood tests. Pretty much any blood panel will include a liver panel. And within the liver panel, there's a test called alanine aminotransferase, or ALT. And in women, ALT scores that exceed 19 are suspicious for some kind of a liver problem. And most any liver issue can cause that, but barring more obvious or exotic causes, we think about fatty liver. Now, guys, we probably get leeway up to 25. And I point out the exact numbers because those are both inside the normal range. So you can be inside the normal range, but at a level in which there's known to be something wrong with your liver. So yeah, take a peek at your last blood test. If your ALT was greater than 19, if you're a woman, or greater than 25 for a man, um, something's not right. So yeah, Holly. Hi, Dr. C. Glad you're here. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> Glad to be back. Uh, and I'm looking, the other thing about office hours is I love to stay on conversational threads. I love to talk about particular topics. So when related questions come up, the things we've already talked about, I love to go further into those because you learn, you learn more that way. And again, you hear the overviews all the time. I wanna take you guys deep and get a thorough understanding of these kinds of things. So with that in mind, Great question. Do liver detoxes help like castor oil packs? You know, castor oil packs are certainly harmless. And the idea is that they have an effect called a counter irritant effect. So basically, if you put something on the top of your body, it may irritate what's below it and cause more blood flow to it. So yeah, you may move more blood through your liver by putting castor oil on the surface. No drawbacks. A lot of liver detoxes, um, not not so much. So the the last book I wrote, the metabolism reset, the last before the current one, metabolism reset diet, was really about this whole thing of fatty liver, how it's a big factor behind stubborn weight gain, and how to go about reversing it. The difficult thing is that a lot of a lot of regimes have people fast or just cut out a lot of food, and it seems to make sense. Like if you force your body to get what's out of storage, you would detox. Well. 
in a lot of cases, you just re-tox. So what happens is when you're fasting, your liver, yeah, a lot of stuff is coming at it. You can break down fat tissue, pull the waste out of that. That sounds cool. But the drawback is your liver is malnourished. So your liver needs a good amount of essential amino acids to package up the toxins and get them out. And at a low food intake, there's no essential amino acids coming in. So your body can't do that as well. That's just one nutrient. There's many others that are necessary for good liver function. So straight out fasting, I'm not a fan of. The Metabolism Reset Diet talks about a 28-day process by which one does meal replacement, uh, good amounts of protein, and a large variety of essential micronutrients and phytonutrients that help the liver work better. And the the most intriguing goal that's often a big a big that's appealing is is weight loss but the real purpose is fat loss and even deeper than that it's about organ fat loss so like liver fat loss so you have fat inside the liver that's the real goal behind the metabolism reset diet and it's it's awesome to hear all the stories we've had of people who reverse fatty liver you know in a short period of time by doing that so as big of a deal as fatty liver is and it is a big deal it's often very reversible. You know, that's the cool thing about the liver is that it's among the most resilient of your organs. You can theoretically lose 80% of it, and the remaining portion can grow back and work quite well. Okay. Hey, Kathleen, good to see you too. Uh, several good questions coming in. Let me just grab a few of these here. I'm going to show some of these. This will show up for some of you all. Uh, so this was from Lori. She said that she recently started on an estradiol patch. How would you expect that to affect my TSH, comma, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, good question, Lori. So now I'm assuming that you are not starting the patch and changing to it from another version of estradiol. If it were a dose equivalent, the effects would be not significant, but I'm assuming you started that new. Now, it can affect your thyroid function. It usually does. In fact, it's predictable that it would affect your thyroid function. And what happens is there's a compound called thyroid binding globulin. And that's a normal protein that makes your thyroid hormones less active. So when thyroid binding globulin is circulating in higher amounts, your thyroid hormones are less active. They're not doing as much. Let me just change my background real quick here. Yeah, so you're basically eating up and neutralizing those thyroid hormones. They're, they're inactive. And estradiol is one of the strongest things that raises the amount of thyroid binding globulin. So the extent to which there's estradiol in circulation, the thyroid hormones are not as biologically active. Now, this has the biggest effect upon TSH scores. You asked about that specifically. And what happens is, when something changes thyroid levels, that's the earliest indicator. So the TSH is how your body wants your thyroid to work, you know, more or less. And once your thyroid's released hormones, you've got a lot of ways to adjust what's in circulation, even if it's not ideal. So when there's too little hormone, the first thing to happen is your TSH elevates. It creeps up a little bit. And your body compensates by keeping T3 and T4 in circulation for longer. So they don't change as quickly. It's not common you would see T3 or T4 or other relevant markers change, but it's really common to see TSH elevate. And Lori, in fact, ideally doctors would anticipate that, and most do need a dose increase by somewhere around a ququarter of a grain for natural desiccated thyroid, or maybe 25 micrograms for a T4 compound. So yeah, talk to your doctor and check soon after changing. If someone does predict ahead of time and they adjust their medicine, you still should check because you may not need that much, you might need more. But yeah, it's almost expected that you'll need to raise your dosage. Now, the same is true on the other end of this. So if the time comes up, Lori, where you say, hey, I've finish with this patch, I no longer need it, totally fine, you can stop that. Well, now you probably won't need quite as much thyroid hormone. So this is also true for uh, topical NHRT creams, for trochies, lozenges, uh, pills, also true for oral contraceptives. Anything that has estradiol in it, natural or synthetic, 
has an effect on thyroid binding globulin. It's also true of the transition from perimenopause to menopause. So during perimenopause, the amount of estradiol that a woman makes fluctuates radically. And that can be one of the difficulties about stabilizing thyroid levels. And also, if a woman naturally goes into menopause and her levels drop, she will often need less thyroid because of that. So good, good question. Um, let's see. Related questions. Let me take a peek at this one. Am I seeing all of it? Yeah, I've been dealing with hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, fatty liver, low iron, and low vitamin D. Wow. Can Hashimoto's cause mental health and or brain or nerve damage? What supplements would you recommend to take? Okay, so detailed, detailed question there. Let me address the various parts of these. Can Hashimoto's cause mental health or brain slash nerve damage? Well, mental health changes, and I wanna really get detailed with you guys. So let's separate out Hashimoto's from hypothyroidism. They often overlap, but they're different things, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune attack, and we, we can see that it's there when someone has thyroid antibodies, uh, antithyroglobulin, antithyroid peroxidase. Not everyone with Hashimoto's has thyroid antibodies, so that's an interesting point. <coughs> Sometimes we know about Hashimoto's being there because of findings on an ultrasound. The least common way we're aware of it is by findings on a biopsy. But yeah, so that's, that's the Hashimoto side. Now, many that have Hashimoto's eventually develop hypothyroidism. So the question is, which symptoms does hypothyroidism cause and are there symptoms that Hashimoto's causes, even if somebody doesn't have hypothyroidism? That's an interesting question. So hypothyroidism definitely can cause a big range of mental health symptoms, depression, anxiety. Um, others can exacerbate others that are present. Thyroid antibodies may also contribute. And I talk about the difference because if you stabilize your thyroid levels as far as TSH, T3, T4, but still have very high antibodies, there still may be some symptoms present. Now, in terms of what supplements to take, well, if you're low in iron and low in vitamin D, those are two. <laughs> uh, stay tuned, you guys. In the coming weeks, month or so, there are some new supplement options that'll be rolling out that will be more effective for some of these things. The easiest starting place is really our daily reset pack. That's our comprehensive multi that has the micronutrients needed to help Hashimoto's and also the vitamin D is within that. Uh, iron is important if you're lacking in that. I've written quite a bit in great detail about how to use it, various types. Probably even more importantly though, Susie, I would suggest looking at the thyroid reset diet. We had someone write in uh, last week, her TSH scores in July were 16.3. I'm not confident about that 0.3, but I'm really confident about the 16, and I'm confident about July. <laughs> so her TSH was 16 just a few months ago, and she was rechecked in October, and it was 1.29. It was perfectly normal and perfectly optimal. All she did was the thyroid reset diet, and you know, her results were not unusual. There's been now many clinical trials of people that have had changes just that dramatic. So that's important for changing the TSH scores, improving T3 and T4. It's also really a first-line treatment for lowering the thyroid antibodies. So Susie, please do consider that. Take a peek, Susie. Google Alan Christensen and iron. That'll be plenty. There's a crazy detailed article that I wrote for you that talks in really good detail about how much iron you would need, what types to take, uh, different versions of that. So yeah, check check that out, but the rest should get you started really well. But yeah, grab the thyroid reset diet and follow that really closely. You got a good chance of reversing all of this. Okay, more questions, really good questions. Um, let's see, there's a really long one. Let me take a peek at this. Well, here's a quick one that's relevant. Uh, I happen to have a blood panel after running a marathon, ALT 24. Other times it's been 19. Can eating a lot of food due to high exercise load cause the ALT to be higher? Does that mean fatty liver? So yeah, Lexi, thank you for asking that. If any time you train really hard and you get some blood tests done, your results might be goofy. 
uh, C-reactive protein, sedimentation rate, various markers of your white blood count, various electrolytes, liver enzymes, they're all goofy. And I could talk about why for each of those in a lot more detail than you'd care to hear about. But it means nothing. And it's not because you ate a lot because of the training, it's because your body was breaking down a lot of tissue. It doesn't mean that was a bad thing. That's just normal in that context. So if you've been around 19, now exact numbers, I've read multiple studies about the threshold of ALT scores in women and risk for fatty liver. Some sources say 18, some sources say 19. It's somewhere right around there. Lexi, if your health is good and your height to waist ratio is favorable, probably not a big thing. If your height to waist is off and you are consistently above that 18, 19 threshold, it's worth thinking about. And in terms of thinking about, you know, one can safely jump into the metabolism reset diet and recheck and see if it's better. Also, a good option can be a liver ultrasound. Now, liver ultrasound doesn't say you definitely do or don't have fatty liver. You can have it and it won't show up. But some people can have it and it's worse than you would guess from their blood tests. And the ultrasound can show that. So that's the perk about it. Uh, if you've got a doctor who's helpful you're seeing anyway, or if you've done things and it's not really improved, yeah, consider an ultrasound. Because in some cases, there's a lot more infiltrate in the liver than the ALT scores would make one guess. Okay. So I'm looking more questions here. So here's one really good one over on Instagram. Is it feasible to incorporate adrenal thyroid metabolism reset diets all into one? I am a steroid dependent Addison's. Okay, so there's a question and a clarification. So let me hit the clarification first. So as a steroid dependent Addison's, those who don't know, Addison's disease is an autoimmune disease of the adrenals. It's just like Hashimoto's to the thyroid is Addison's to the adrenals. It's the exact same idea. The difference though is that Hashimoto's is often on a pretty big continuum. Not everyone has zero thyroid function. Most have some thyroid function. But with Addison's disease, most have almost no adrenal function. It's mostly on or off. Now, steroid dependent. Steroid's a loaded term, and we think about like bodybuilders abusing the stuff, you know, like synthetic testosterone. But steroids are just all hormones that come from below the waist. So everything that your adrenals, testicles, ovaries make, they're all steroids. And to be precise, in this case, with Addison's disease, it's glucocorticoids that are used. And those are cortisol or cortisol analogs. And they're no different than thyroid medicine for Hashimoto's, for hypothyroidism. Uh, they can be more life-threatening in the short term if they are missed. Now, in this case, the adrenal reset will not change Addison's disease. It will not cause you to regrow your adrenals and make cortisol again. I wish that would, but it won't do that. It does improve the cortisol rhythm for most who have normal cortisol output. So if you're making any cortisol, but you're not making enough or at the right times, then that diet can be very useful for you. But it won't reverse Addison's disease, unfortunately. Now, your daily rhythm of cortisol is a function of your medication. It's not really a function of your body's internal chemistry. Ideally, you'd be on a regime that of medication that would try to not only give you about as much as you would make, but would time it like your body would make it when you were healthy. So that's about the adrenal side of that. Now, in terms of the, uh, let's pretend that you weren't steroid dependent because many are probably asking the same question. The short answer is yes, it's darn easy. Now, metabolism reset diet is something you would do for 28 day periods of time. If the goal is a smaller amount of waste loss, one of those might do the job and you're good to go. Most will do one per year for maintenance. Others have more waste loss they wish to achieve, and they might do multiple cycles in the course of a year. You want at least two weeks off between cycles. Okay, and I'll come back to wrapping this all up in a minute. I'm just giving an overview here. So the thyroid reset diet is really simple. This is basically green light, yellow light, red light foods based on iodine content. And as long as you're trying to help your thyroid work better, just do green light foods. Just skip the yellow light, skip the red light. Once your thyroid's working fine again and you're missing some yellow light foods, you can add a couple in per day and do fine. So to do these together, basically just follow the metabolism reset, 28 day resets while sticking to green light foods. And there's almost all the foods that I recommend are already green light foods. In the metabolism reset, I did offer 
uh, lower fat cottage cheese and Greek yogurt as a protein option. I also did off mention about eggs being a protein option. You wouldn't do egg yolks and you wouldn't do those dairy products with the thyroid reset guidelines. Uh, I believe there, there was also some other types of fish that were options on the metabolism reset that were not among the low iodine types of seafood and thyroid reset. So you can do them all very easy. Now, adrenal reset is about really timing of carbohydrate to recreate a good cortisol cycle. And with that one, it's really just a matter of uh, having some healthy carbs later in the day, less earlier in the day. So you raise the carbohydrate intake between breakfast, lunch, to dinner. And the rationale there is carbohydrate helps some insulin production. You want some. Without it, you can't make T3. And without it, you can't make glutathione. And without it, you elevate cortisol. So if insulin's too low, cortisol gets too high. And cortisol is a glucocorticoid. So by having an appropriate amount of healthy carbs later in the day, you can help lower cortisol at night and push that rhythm back again. So you can do all three of those things at once pretty easily. <laughs> um, I have only one adrenal and no adrenal function. Okay, yep, so that, that fits then. All right, let me grab one or two more here on the other platforms. Just take a look at things. Oh, I'll take the old question off. Let's see. So here's one I think I can address quickly. Wondering if there's a link between iodine and vaginismus. So pain with sex for many years. Sorry about the question. Trying to know what is happening. Yeah, involuntary tightening of the muscles around the vagina. You know, no. So iodine has a lot of effects on thyroid function, and thyroid function has a lot of effects on other facets of your health. But if your thyroid function is stable, you just wouldn't think about iodine being a relevant factor to other symptoms. So I've not heard of direct ties between thyroid levels, hypo or hyper, and vaginismus. So I don't think that would be relevant. The iodine certainly wouldn't be, and thyroid function, I've not heard of direct ties that way. So yeah, straightforward one. Okay, here's a popular one. Uh, what are what are the best ways to lower both antibodies from Chris? Hey Chris, so we've got antithyroglobulin, antithyroid peroxidase. There's also thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, and the things that lower those uh, basic ideas we think about diet, supplements, and the role of medications. So diet, thyroid reset diet. The antibodies elevate because iodine builds up in the thyroid and it creates an autoimmune re reaction. Thyroglobulin is the template on which iodine attaches. It has room for a certain number of iodine atoms between 11 and 13. Uh, when there's more iodine in the diet, more builds up on thyroglobulin. Extra iodine creates free radical damage and it triggers an overall immune response to thyroglobulin. So how does thyroid peroxidase tie in? Well, it's the, it's the enzyme that brings iodine onto thyroglobulin in the first, first place. So it's there in that same, that same context. So that's the main dietary factor. Supplements, I did make a blend. We're on back order. It's coming back pretty quick, but it's called antibody support. And it's the three main things documented to help thyroid antibodies. There's one extract of nigella sativa, and there's also a version of inositol and selenium. So these things are all well documented to safely improve upon those, and that's all in antibody support. In terms of medications, if one does need them and do better with them, then they should be used to the extent that the TSH is kept on the lower side, and your best TSH is something that does take some thought, perhaps a talk with your doctor. You don't want it too low, but the higher it gets, the more it can worsen the overall antibody levels. So those are the three things that are by far the best documented to help lower the, the, those two thyroid antibodies. Some of them have effects upon the third one that I mentioned. Some do not, but that address, addresses your question. Kim, hope you're feeling better, Dr. C. Yeah, thank you, Kim. I spoke to a, another friend who's a doctor recently and told her about it. And she's like, wow, I'm glad you lived. I'm like, yeah, it's <laughs> me too. <laughs> that, was a, that was a real possible outcome. Okay, really good follow-up crush question from Chris. Does a person need to be concerned about lowering antibodies? What, what 
if D, selenium, et cetera, don't lower them? Well, some should be concerned, some should not. So Chris, I did a, you're on YouTube. I, I've got some YouTube videos on this topic in crazy detail. And uh, they were all, one was all in deep dive about diet, one was meds, one was supplements. And the first one, Chris, take the first one that talked about diet, because in that one, I talked the most about who would or would not need to lower them. General answer is that if they're, the further they are above 500, the more they can affect certain symptoms. That can include facial swelling, uh, fatigue symptoms, hair loss, those are the big ones. And there can be health risks. So infertility and cardiovascular risk are known health risks. And then finally, there's a higher risk of thyroid disease progression. So those are the main reasons you wanna lower those. If your antibodies are very low and those things are not really relevant for you, it may not be as important, but those are the main considerations. And vitamin D, if you're lacking vitamin D, that does make you more apt to develop autoimmune disease in general. But if you're not deficient in it, taking vitamin D won't push your antibody levels down. That's a, that's a big misnomer about vitamin D. We talk about all these things that it does. Yes and no. If you're deficient in it, then it helps. So like if you lost your keys, your car won't budge, right? And, in, and getting a new set of keys will make your car work a whole lot better. But if you already have your keys, more keys won't do a lick of good. And that's how vitamin D plays out in a lot of these contexts. If you're not deficient in it, it won't make a difference. It's not really helpful. Okay, so related questions. Here's, here's another good related one. This is from Bonnie. Do you recommend LDN to lower thyroid antibodies from Hashimoto's? I don't, Bonnie. Here's my thought process on that. I've tracked it since 98. There was a Facebook group. Um, I forgot the exact name, but it was people who were taking LDN for, for those purposes and wanting to see what would happen and just tracking the results. I did surveys with that group and the short answer was there was no, there was no real results. They weren't, some people saw antibody levels change. And here's a really important point, you guys. So if someone did take LDN and their antibody levels plummeted, would that mean the LDN lowered their antibodies? Trick question. Not necessarily. So antibody levels can fluctuate. So on the other hand, if there's a big group of people who took LDN and a big group that didn't, and this group that did, their levels were much consistently lower than the other group, well, that would be more than just fluctuations. But yeah, one person short term, you couldn't really say if that definitely did it. So what they saw in this group, though, was that there were not consistent effects. There were a couple of folks who saw their antibodies change a little bit, but when they looked over longer periods of time, they saw that it was more of a fluke than anything. Now, since then, there was a large study that came out, actually quite recently. This was done in Norway. They had about 600 people, divide, all, all were on thyroid medications, pretty big range of types. And the main promise that we hear, Bonnie, is that LDN reverses autoimmunity and causes people to need less medication. That's what we hear all the time. So this study asked that question. And one group of 300 took LDN, the other group of 300 did not. They were tracked for three years. And the simple question was, did the group on LDN need more dose reductions than the other group? And if they would have, I'd be having a different conversation with you right now. I'd be saying, oh, it really seemed to work. It might be a consideration for those purposes. But not only did it not work, but those on LDN needed more dose increases than the other group. Now, it wasn't by a huge amount, so I couldn't say definitely that LDN slowed their thyroid function, but it sure the heck didn't improve it. It definitely didn't improve their thyroid function in controlled settings. So no, I wouldn't recommend it. And the other thought is that it's not benign. In the big scheme of medications and drugs and narcotics, it's not the most dangerous one by any means, but it's not benign. People can have seizures as side effects. People can be fatigued as side effects. There may be dependency issues. So if it worked really, really well and there was no drawbacks to it, it could be a good consideration, but I don't see those things lining up very well. Okay, so thinking about related questions. Um, okay, so here's one, and I think I was, I think I got a correspondence here from Bonnie earlier. Can you help me understand the relation between the parathyroid and osteoporosis in a teen? Which lab tests could be run to understand root causes? Well, yeah, so, so Bonnie, thank you for that. So parathyroid disease and osteoporosis. So a certain percent of people have hyperparathyroidism. 
And what that does is it pulls a lot of calcium into your bloodstream. Now, your body stores calcium in your bones and your gut. Those are the main calcium banks, so to speak. So if you're always pulling it in your bloodstream, you're taking it out of those places, and the bones often thin. Parathyroid disease is rarer in, in pediatric groups. It's not impossible, but it is quite a bit rarer. In terms of lab tests, serum calcium and parathyroid hormone are where we see that. Now, you don't even need to have parathyroid checked first, and serum calcium is a very common blood test. There's a thing called a chemistry panel, and in most screening tests, they will include a chemistry panel, and that includes serum calcium. So really precise numbers. If serum calcium is blatantly above range, well, that's a red flag. However, this is a case to where things can be in range but still significant. If serum calcium is repeatedly above 9.8 but in range, then that is suspicious. So what happens is if serum calcium is above 9.8, there should be a corresponding decrease in parathyroid output. But for some people, they're a little high in calcium, but their parathyroids don't get it and they don't slow down. So that can be an earlier sign of parathyroid disease. But Bonnie, if you saw that his serum calcium levels were 9.8 or below, there really wouldn't be a big suspicion of parathyroid disease and not a lot of likelihood to pursue that further. I think I just saw a dear friend jump on, uh, Dr. Lyon. Hey, good to see you, my friend. Uh, thank you so much. He sent me some well wishes when I was sick. <laughs> yeah, doing much better and very appreciative for that. So other causes of osteopenia in teens, you know, Brooke, I remember you saying that your son recently had a growth spurt, and sometimes that's a cause of osteopenia, believe it or not. So growth spurts cause a lot of mobilization of calcium for new bone to grow, and sometimes those areas can appear off. If it's been two years since his last bone density study, the first thing I would think about is just updating that and seeing if there's been progression or not. If that is persisting, then that really would evaluate, would necessitate a good evaluation of his nutritional and endocrine status. So yeah, hopefully that's useful. <laughs> Miss you too, Dr. Lyon. Hope to see you sometime soon. Love to get caught up or just chat somewhere along the way and hear how you and your beautiful family are doing. Okay, let's see. Okay, here's a great one too. This is from Lori. After completing three months on the, the thyroid reset diet, do I need to worry about getting enough iodine? Do I need to get my iodine level tested after the diet? So Lori, so a couple, couple things in there. There's getting enough or too much and then testing your iodine. So two points. I want to talk about both of those. So in the book, I talk about green light, yellow light, red light foods. There's really no iodine-free foods. So even the green light foods have iodine. And the body's one requirement for iodine is thyroid function. So if your thyroid function is doing better and stabilizing, you don't need to worry. And even then, on the modern diet, modern foods that come from you know iodine-rich soils, a broad variety of areas, uh, if your diet includes any mixture of animal foods in it, you'll not be lacking in that. Those needs can differ during pregnancy, so please do bear that in mind, but otherwise you won't get too little. Now to the second part of your question, you don't need to get your levels tested. It's not helpful in most cases. The one scenario where it may help is if you did the diet just full on and your thyroid numbers did not improve. In those cases, testing can help answer whether, whether it's just not going to help you or whether you're still dumping a lot of iodine. If you're still dumping a lot of iodine, either there are some sources you're still consuming that you didn't, you just missed, or you had such a high amount that you've not yet completed the detox of it. So how would you test? There's really only one way that's useful for that, and that's a urinary iodine to creatinine ratio test. That's not the same thing as a urinary iodine test, so please hear that. It's a specific subtype of a urinary iodine test. I have written about this. If you Google Alan Christensen iodine testing, or if you've got the Thyroid Reset Diet book, I talk about exactly how to do that test, what the results would mean, what the various ranges are. So yeah, if, you, if the diet was useful, you don't need to test, you don't need to worry. If you've achieved some benefits from that, you do have the option of moving on to the maintenance phase, which allows you to add in two more yellow light foods. So you can get a bit more iodine in. And the purpose is not because it's dangerous to avoid them. The purpose is just because maybe there's foods you've been missing. <laughs> so if there's no foods you're missing, if you're doing great on green light foods, you don't have to change that. 
But if there's something you really miss, like an egg yolk here and there or some yogurt, then yeah, if you stabilize, you can add up to two servings back in with no ill effects. Okay, let's see. I'm probably going to be able to get one or two more in. Um, <laughs> I've learned so much from you. Best thyroid doctor, thank you for that. Uh, heck. Yeah, Bonnie, I took LDN for over a year for Graves' disease. It didn't change how I felt. No, I wouldn't expect that it would. Mm. Heck, I'm really struggling. There's a lot of really good questions. Um, quick one, Bonnie, I would avoid iodine definitely in your vitamins with Graves' disease. Uh, iron... I recommend iron to be used specifically. If you know you need it, you should use it uh, appropriately. But I don't recommend it in the context of, of vitamins. It's better off not to be inside of a multivitamin, if that makes sense. Uh, Barb, so continued chronic elevated TSH 5.0 despite taking NDT dose three hours prior to lab draw. Huh, FT3 was elevated, T4 normal taking the T4 equivalent dose based on my weight. Should I look into a problem with pituitary? Try a different brand or switch to tyrosine. So Barb, if you want to talk about, I, I, may, I may still be here when you put it up, but if you want to put up approximate body weight and doses you were referring to, I can give some more input. Usually not a pituitary issue. You know, more and more, if someone's not on medication, it sounds like you weren't before you started taking this. Um, I, I don't know your low, actually, I don't know your levels before you were on the medication. But more and more, I see people just do well on the thyroid reset diet. If you weren't here, I mentioned a case a bit ago of someone with a TSH of 16, 16.3. Uh, and within three months on the thyroid reset diet, she was down to 1.29. That's really common. So if you've not done that thoroughly, I would even focus more on that than with your doctor's awareness and guidance than, than just on the medications. There are many that need much higher doses than you would expect. Almost no one fails to have their TSH come down from medications. That can happen with pituitary disease that you asked about, but that's quite rare. And if someone has that, they normally have a lot of other hormonal abnormalities as well, including ACTH, FSH, LH. The pituitary, if it's goofing up, it goofs up across the board. It doesn't goof up in just one way. So yeah, I would think more so about those factors. Um, oh, 160. So if you want to mention the doses you were given, Barb. So at 160 pounds, if you were given a dose of uh, two grains of thyroid, it should have changed unless you're not absorbing it, or 200 micrograms of T4. So those are, per body weight, you make somewhere around 0.8 to 1.1 micrograms of T4 per pound of body weight. Oh, so 90 milligrams of NP. It's entirely possible that wouldn't have changed your levels. Uh, it could have, but it also could not have. If you had taken twice that much, you would have to be malabsorbing for it not to change your levels. But 90, sure, that could happen. That's really not unusual. But again, you may do well with, without, without that approach. Um, the, the diet can work quite a bit better than medication for most people. And what we see too is that the meds can always adjust your levels. They can always do that, but they don't consistently control the symptoms. And that's why I like to see diet make such a big difference for people. All right. Let's see. I'm just screening here. Um, maybe one more. <laughs> I, am, I am fading. I don't quite have my reserves all the way back just yet. But there's a lot of really good questions here. One last one. Hard to find vitamins without iodine. Bonnie, yeah, take a look at the... Uh, Dr. Christensen's store and the daily reset pack. All of our stuff is certified iodine free for that reason. Um, Barb, should I up the dose? Barb, talk to your doctor, jump on the thyroid reset diet. Medications are often not the answer for people. You can often reverse this without them. And there was one more that I saw, here we go. This is from Gina. Even on a gluten-free, no wheat, rye, barley, no dairy, just eating greens and certain proteins, still losing my hair, hard to lose weight. So, so Gina, yeah, I'm glad you put that up there. 
I, if you had celiac disease, the grains could have been a factor for malabsorption, and malabsorption of protein or iron could have been a factor for hair loss. Barring celiac disease, I can't think of any ways that those foods would have caused hair loss for you. Uh, hair loss is rarely about a bad food. It's more about something your body is missing. And by far, the most common thing you'd be missing would be iron. Uh, Gina, please Google Alan Christensen and hair loss. Not too long ago, I wrote a very detailed blog about the main kinds of hair loss and the main things that cause that. Please check that out. It'll lead you in some different directions. Low levels of iron, uh, high levels of cortisol, thyroid disease, these are big drivers of that. Grains and dairy, there are definitely those that can cut them out and improve their health for various reasons, but not so much for hair loss. That would be pretty unusual. So yeah, let's, let's have you pivot, please. <laughs> All right, I'm going to wrap this one up. Good to see you guys. I plan on being back next week. Uh, regular schedule, same time, same place. So be, be there, be square. Yeah. <laughs> Take great care, and I'll see you all really soon. Bye-bye.